Welcome to On Our Minds. I'm Dr. Brenda Wilson. And Dr. Russ Witcher. And we are two journalism professors here at Tennessee Tech. On this podcast, we sit down with other faculty and talk academics, personal interests, and teaching experiences. All right. Um, on Our Minds today, we're talking with history professor Troy Smith. So would you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm history professor Troy Smith. <laughs> I work in the history department. Uh, I am a, uh, I'm a native. I'm from White County. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree here at Tennessee Tech and my master's and PhD at the University of Illinois. The line I fill here officially is uh, Native American Studies and Environmental History. My, my PhD focus was the history of the South and race and ethnicity with Native American and African American intersections. So most of what I do, uh, even though it's kind of like varied, has something to do with identity, really. Okay. And when he talks about the line he feels, that's academic speak for why he's hired here, what he's teaching here, right? Exactly, so, yes. Okay, well, um, what drove you to this field of study or academic area? Uh, well, I'll tell you, when I was uh, an undergrad here at Tech, and I was you know, preparing to send applications into to grad school, you, know, you have to actually have a focus. And I was having a hard time because there's so many different things that I liked. I liked Southern history. I liked the Civil War. I liked the American West. I liked Native American history. I liked African American history. So I found a topic, which is the Cherokees and the other uh, members of the five civilized tribes adopting plantation slavery and then being sent to uh, on the Trail of Tears, their slaves going with them, and then them fighting in the Civil War. So that covered all the things I liked. And actually, I was also kind of torn because I loved the history of Japan. And at the program at Illinois, you had to have a comparative element from a different hemisphere. So I did graduate uh, level work in the history. So I teach the history of Japan here, uh, which means that I can can do all kinds of different things. That does sound uh, great how those intersect, all those different fields. Yeah, how did you uh, decide on Illinois for your graduate work? Well, as you know, when you're uh, picking a graduate program, it's not the location, it's who you want to work with, Mm -hmm. right? And so I really wanted to work with either Fred Hoxie at Illinois or Theta Purdue at North Carolina. And so I got accepted to both programs, uh, and Illinois offered me uh, full funding and uh, research assistantships. And te- um, North Carolina only offered me half funding and sent me a letter on how to apply for food stamps. <laughs> uh, so that's why <laughs> that's really uh, what sent me toward uh, Illinois. But Theta Purdue wound up being very helpful to me anyway. Okay. All right. Uh, and you say that you're interested in the in the Civil War in the South. Um, what? Well, how do you feel like Southerners even now relate to the Civil War? I mean, in, in many ways, it's, I, feel, I, I find that it's not over. That's true. And I feel like, especially around here, mm-hmm. a lot of people from here don't have a very full understanding of how the Civil War operated here, by mm-hmm. which I mean it was very divided. You know, you cannot just assume that if your family is from around here that they were Mm pro-Confederate because there were a lot of Mm pro-Union families. uh, I had a friend from high school uh, found out that one of his ancestors was in the Union Army, and he said, that can't be possible. (laughs) They weren't even from the North. So that's that's something. Another thing is that um, a lot of people are fascinated by the Civil War. There's a lot of uh, history buffs that could run circles around me talking about battles and campaigns and who was in charge of which wing, but they often don't understand the big picture Mm -hmm. of what was happening and why it was happening Mm -hmm. and what the results were. Right. Right. Yeah. 
my my family's from Macon County, and and they fought with the Union too. Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, they were. Uh, my great grandfather, I think he was uh, based out of Bowling Green. Mm-hmm. So you know, a lot of people forget that Northern Tennessee, where I'm from, they really kind of gravitated to Kentucky, mm-hmm. as opposed to say Nashville. There were more Union troops raised in Tennessee mm-hmm. than any other Confederate state. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had ancestors on both sides, so I'm glad they didn't shoot each other. <laughs> <laughs> that could have caused me problems. Yeah, that, that Tennessee-Kentucky line is where a lot of the divisions, I think. Yes, mm-hmm. the Tennessee-Kentucky um, line, and also the farther east you go in Tennessee, the more pro-union people were, mm-hmm. right? There was a strong union support in East Tennessee, Northern Georgia, Western North Carolina, uh, Eastern Kentucky. In other words, Appalachia, mm-hmm. where you can't mm-hmm. grow cotton. Right. True. So they were not as invested they in didn't. slavery. So, and in, in Troy and I are both from White County, mm-hmm. and there was a, a famous Civil War era uh, Champ Ferguson stories. Yes. And mm-hmm. I've yes. read a lot of books about him. My grandparents lived in the area that usually shows up in a lot of the books of uh, where he, his family lived and kind of where he called home. So I've written a lot Cherry about Creek Champ. Area. I've written yeah. a lot about Champ Ferguson. Mm-hmm. Um, I had an article 20 years ago when I was in, still an undergrad in Civil War times. I did a chapter in uh, the book uh, People of the Upper Cumberland about him, and I wrote a novel hmm. about him, which has been, this is a low bar, but the best-selling <laughs> <laughs> I still get, you know, uh, every once in a while, some royalties. In fact, a few years ago, um, I got a royalty check. It was like 30 40 bucks for the month and took the family out to dinner after church on Sunday. And my, my daughter said, wow, you know, if Champ Ferg- Ferguson hadn't shot that lady in Cherry <laughs> Creek, we wouldn't be eating Mexican right now. That's right. I need to get a copy. Is it on Amazon? That's it one is. I haven't read. It's called read. Good Rebel Soil. The Champ Ferguson story. Huh. I may have read it. Surely I'd remember that. That's a great title. Thank you. That was yeah. his last words. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't bury me here in Nashville. Bury me in White County in good rebel soil. Can we can we delve into the, uh, the folklore around it? Um, there is that conspiracy theory that he did not actually die at the hanging in Nashville. Yes, there is that conspiracy theory that where, it was where all are you on faked, that? right? There yeah. was a false bottom. False bottom. He rode out and west. And then he went out to Oklahoma. And mm-hmm. there's actually, there's a guy, an old guy from Oklahoma, who comes around every once in a while uh, and talks to people here, who claims he's the grandson of Champ Ferguson and a Cherokee princess. After the fact, okay. Yes, I think that he and Billy the Kid and Jesse James probably all got together and formed a band. (laughs) Sure, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Like a musical band, I can see. Yeah, some of the support they gave to that theory was that his wife and daughter drove out west, and and, and those days women wouldn't have gone out there by themselves, so he had to have been in the wagon hiding. Uh, That's one of the There's a lot of uh, real long reaches Mm -hmm. uh, for for, for that kind of stuff. So you don't really buy into that theory I don't buy into that, but I'm not sure if you've read a lot about him. If you read the book Confederate Outlaw by Brian McKnight, which is the best biography, it came out about 10 years ago, he makes a really good argument that the outlaw Josie Wales was sort of a blend of Champ Ferguson and bloody Bill Anderson mm. from Missouri. Mm-hmm. Because in the novel, he was from East Tennessee, and he had just moved to Missouri, and it said a lot about his Scots-Irish heritage and his vendettas and all that stuff. It is fascinating. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Really cool. Keep you busy for a long time. It you know, would. what I find ironic is I've gone down a lot of times to where he's buried, and it is one of the quietest, most peaceful places Shady I've and ever been, yeah. and he's the most violent person in White County history. It's it, ironic. So you've been to the gravesite. Um, one of the other theories was that the um, tombstone is misspelled, and, and my argument there is back in those days, <laughs> There wasn't, it wasn't easy to fix a misspelling, yeah. you know, so that wasn't a strong enough argument for me to believe that it was I, I don't you know, purposefully misspelled or whatever. Why would they have turned it loose? Exactly. They had no reason to. Right. Actually. But it's fun to imagine, huh? That <laughs> yeah. Well, he had made the mistake of threatening at one point 
during the war to go to Nashville and cut the governor's throat. Mm -hmm. And the governor happened to be Andrew Johnson, who was president at the end of the war. So (laughs) that probably didn't help. (laughs) Uh, I I, uh, teach a history of journalism class. One of the things that I have trouble with a lot of my students is they just don't like history. Mm -hmm. I, I, I assume that you've had that problem with some students too. What do you think the problem is that students just think, oh, this is boring, and how do we overcome that as educators? I always feel like when someone says that, they may have encountered some bad history teachers Mm -hmm. earlier in life, Mm -hmm. middle school or high school. Um, I had some history teachers that I really loved as people uh, that were not necessarily, like I had one that told me that uh, Pueblo Indians lived in adobe houses. Um, (laughs) But... What you get a lot in those types of uh, classes in like K-12 is lists of things Mm -hmm. to memorize. Dates. And dates. And I tell my students, and some of my colleagues might not like this, I don't know, uh, I don't care if you get the date right because you can look that up Mm -hmm. on Google. If you Mm -hmm. get in the right decade, I want you to get (laughs) the big picture. Mm -hmm. So I present them with the story and point out why it's relevant to now, what the consequences were. And I feel like I have made a lot of converts Good in my classes. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think it's just uh, bad prior experiences in the mm-hmm. classroom <laughs> that have to be overcome. Yeah. Yes, that's one of the questions I was going to ask you is how do you respond to a student who says, why do I need to know this? Who's, I imagine some of what you teach is in the general education. Mm-hmm. Or do you teach in the... So yeah, I do your that. colleagues as yeah. well. Um, and so we have students take these gen ed classes, general education classes, because we believe that is what a well-rounded college student needs to know. They don't always share that perspective. And so mm. they may ask, why, why am I taking, why am I being made to take this class? Yeah. So do you In have a survey answer? classes, you don't have history majors usually. Yeah. It's everybody Every else. Major. Half of them don't want to be there. Mm-hmm. They have to be there. Um, I have... I have a spiel that I go through on the first day of class in my survey classes. I tell the students that I'm I'm going to make a bold assertion. And that assertion is that one day you'll look back on this class as one of the most important ones that you took in college. Uh, And, you know, uh, 10 years from now, if that hasn't happened, don't tell me about it. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But the reason for that is that You know, at some point, I tell them, if it hasn't happened already, you're going to look around yourself, look around the world, look around the country and say, this sucks. I wish there were something I could do. And there is. Maybe not one individual, but as, you know, part of an informed citizenry, there is something you can do. Because all of American history, it's not big, important men changing everything. It's movements. But the first step is understanding how it works and how it came to be that way. And that's the step that we're taking with this class. And again, I think that uh, that gets most people's attention. Inspires them to know to want to know more. Well, I like to say that I don't just teach history, I preach history. There you go. Yeah. Well, you don't have to sell me. I love history. I'm curious about yeah. it. I don't understand people who don't like history don't <laughs> to begin with. I know. It, it seems that uh, a lot of times people who don't like history, the older they get, the more they change their mind about yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And the people that we're talking to are like 20. So right. they, they got a ways to go, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, to have that appreciation in many instances. Their personal experience doesn't include a lot of history yet. No. I'm not going not gonna to name any names, <laughs> but one of my colleagues in a different college from mine uh, made a comment one time about how worthless history was. What does the Civil War matter? And this happened to have been in 2017, right after the whole Charlotte. And I'm like, you know, wow. I'm spending most of my time these last few weeks explaining this stuff to people who don't understand it, and their inaccurate understanding is leading to a lot of things, consequences, uh, repercussions today. So... He said he had said, you know, we should be building a bridge to the future. You can't build a bridge to the future unless you set it down on this side first. That foundation. Yes. Did did you sway that? Uh, uh, 
I don't think I did. Not sure. Uh, I don't think I did. That colleague? Uh, yeah, I didn't sit by him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should just all sit around and talk about history there. That one colleague, that might help. Yeah, the, the thing I like about history is surprises. Like, for example, you mentioned uh, Indians mm -hmm. owning slaves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's definitely something that's, that's not well known, but yet it's right. still a part of history. And so, to me, it's finding the, the lost history. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And in that sense, being a historian, people think I'm weird because I get all excited going into archives and libraries. But it is exciting because it's like being a detective mm -hmm. or a hunter. You know, you're on the trail trying to find something, particularly if you can find connections that no one else has ever made before, but they're there. Yeah. You know, that's exciting. Yeah, I was surprised to learn that too. I read actually in the, the Tennessee Magazine where they have a history column and it was um, showing old uh, newspaper ads um, yeah. about, yeah, and, and it was a, a Native American who had placed an ad because he was trying to relocate, re, what's the word I'm looking for? He was trying to find the slave mm -hmm. that had run away. So, um, yeah, and I like that they use old newspaper clippings and things. It gives our field some relevance, too, yeah. the first mm -hmm. draft, as they say, of history right. um, and the importance of that, like the having a part of the record, the historical record. I've got a or an 1852 Sparta newspaper in glass in my office. That's awesome, yeah. There's a lot of those ads yeah. in it. Um, it's just it's eye-opening for sure. So, well, one thing that I've, I've been here for quite a while as a professor, <clears throat> what changes have you seen in higher education over the last couple of decades? I mean, are they mostly good? Uh, are the students that different? Uh, just your overall perception of, of the atmosphere. I'm seeing changes on two levels, one with the students and one with just not specifically our administration, but just how universities are run mm -hmm. around the country. Uh, and I don't think either of those changes are necessarily for the better. I will say that students are, are great. They're very, I think, they're a lot more hardworking than people give them credit for, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is unfair. And I think that they have a lot of positive energy often. But what I have noticed... I started noticing it uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, students coming in that did not know some of the basic things about history or English that I would expect anyone who had been to high school to know. Um, and students were coming in more and more often wanting to have, to be given a big long list of all the answers for the final exam, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then let's just stick to that, which that's a reflection of how they've been taught because last 20 years, yeah. right, since the, uh, well, uh, Bush, Obama forward, mm -hmm. um, the uh, you know, no child left behind, right? this kind of uh, obsession with standardized test scores, yeah. which means that I feel like in K-12, there's only a certain number of things that they're expected to have to know to pass that standardized test, and they just hammer that over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they don't have time for nuance. Yeah, They don't have time to more fully explain things. And so students are coming, and they get... A lot of them can get easily frustrated uh, or overwhelmed with the style of teaching that we do that is so different in college. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, expecting more, thinking outside the box, creative thinking. Uh, so I think that in that regard, the whole country has gone in the wrong direction. Uh, people got worried that students in Asia were doing better at math yeah. than our students. So they changed everything around. And I think that they lost a lot of what gave our students an advantage, that innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been stifled. Mm hmm uh, and so there's a lot of, I spent a lot of time teaching things that I would have expected people to already know about yeah. like 
parts of speech and stuff. Um, and a lot of time catching them up. Um, so there's that, that change. On the larger uh, level beyond the students, just academia in general, especially over about the last 10 years, there has, it, it's all become more, it feels corporatized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a business model. Sometimes when I have issues with things, I'm told, well, that's how all the businesses do it, you know, and I'm not in a business. Um, and there's more and more, I feel, what with the, the use of so many adjuncts mm -hmm. and yeah. the diminishing amount of people with tenure and now threats to tenure, more and more power taken away from the teachers, just as happened in K through 12. Uh, with kind of like this sort of uh, regime being imposed. This is how you are going to have to do it. Uh, and it's a way that is going to please our customers the mm -hmm. best. And I, I feel like we're definitely going full steam in the wrong direction. I, I really wish that whether you're talking about academia or, or uh, K-12, I, I really wish that uh, politicians and businesses would just kind of get out of the way of teachers and let them teach yeah. and do their job. Yeah. Trust the process. Yes. Trust the experts who are trained in how to do what they do. Mm -hmm. and, and having discussions about history with your students so that they start making those connections. Oh, yes. That's, that's one critical of, thinking. Yeah. That's one of the things I like the best when I'm talking and I frequently will talk about things that they're familiar with, but not in the way they're familiar with it, right? Learning new things. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking to them and I see that light bulb go on over somebody's head, their eyes light up and they're like, oh my gosh, I understand. That is very rewarding. You know, that's what I get up for. And personally speaking, that's when I remember the history, memorizing dates and events. Yeah. I won't, I won't remember it. I yeah. don't remember the titles of the books I've read of Champ Ferguson, except I do remember the story there mm -hmm. and, and the conspiracy theories and the kind of unique approaches to, to that telling his story. Yeah. You if, know? if you just cram your head full of dates mm -hmm. and uh, names without any context, you might pass the test, but then the next day you won't remember it. It'll be gone. Yeah. Uh, I want people to get the big picture. That is, that is the way then that they'll connect that with their contemporary yes, lives. Exactly. So, I guess my final question would be, uh, what would be your advice to to students who are thinking about uh, a career as an educator? I mean, how would you? How would you say uh, to avoid certain pitfalls perhaps that befell you and uh, just some encouragement because, like you say, it, 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 my wife's a teacher too in, in uh, middle school, mm -hmm. uh, and the morale is not good. Right. You know, how, what would you say to a potential teacher saying this is a good career choice? What I would say is if you feel like, this is something that you were born to do, and you have to do it, then you should do it. Mm -hmm. But you should go in with the recognition of how hard it's, it's going to be, and how, especially in academia, how the deck is stacked against you. you know, there's no guarantee you'll get a job, mm -hmm. and you need to be aware of that. Um, but I've had a lot of students that have gone on to, to grad school. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at this point, uh, even gotten through. Uh, and they are the ones that they just have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say don't enter it lightly. Same thing, you know, I also write fiction, and I've done a lot of talking with people about the process of being an author and writing fiction. And I tell them, do it because you have to do it. Do yeah. it for yourself. Don't do it thinking you're going to get rich. Because right. you know, like one person in a million will, but there's no guarantee of that. Just the other thing that I tell potential 
uh, students is like, you know, pick a field, do like I did, take all the things you like and find a, like a Venn diagram point, and that's going to keep you interested, mm-hmm. you know, and it's also going to give you breadth as well as depth that's going to help. Okay. It's and true. And we, we've kind of discussed the idea of, of ending our podcast with the same question of all guests. Okay. We haven't Before really we end, I feel yes. like I have to plug my upcoming book. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, it's called, actually, they just changed the title. I'm not sure if I can remember the new subtitle. Uh, but it's Shaolin Brew, S H A O, uh, which is a Wu Tang Clan song. Shaolin Brew, Race, Identity, and the Development of the Superhero. Okay. That ought to interest our students out there. I would think right. so. University, uh, Mississippi University Press. And we could. Get the, probably the link to that uh, and information out, up yeah. on our website. So It may yeah. be a few months. Fantastic. Yes, thanks for sharing that. Um, and I, again, we haven't really arrived at what our standard question will be, but we were discussing it before the show that we kind of like to hear from faculty who might want to share um, anything surprising or odd that you've ever experienced um, or even the most fulfilling part part of your job. Um, so kind of wherever you want to go with that. I thought you were going to ask me my favorite swear word. <laughs> we, we consider I that. I think the two of you may watch or listen yes. to the same podcast. Yes, yes. Yes. We, we try to branch out. We don't want to steal their idea, but something wacky. Um, I titled it the, Wackademia. The, the wackiest <laughs> things I probably can't repeat. Okay. And that's, that's what um, we, we thought. Entertaining. I guess it's entertaining to other people. And sometimes, you know, I make a I make a stink about people having their cell phones on. Sometimes I forget to turn mine off, yeah. and my ringtone so that's embarrassing. is uh, the Roger Miller song from the Disney Robin Hood cartoon. Huh. Robin Hood, little John, walking through the forest, lolly oo, lolly golly, what a day! So I'll be up there lecturing, and all of a sudden, that's coming out of my pocket. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 embarrassing. I thought um, you were going to say when you get a someone from history, the names. Uh, Interpose or something. I sometimes say things and I look at their faces in in the the room and oh, I realize I don't know what I've just said, but it didn't make sense. That happens to me all, <laughs> all the time. time yeah. yeah. Uh, the most fulfilling thing for me is when students come back either at the end when they're about to graduate or after they've graduated and tell me that I made a difference. Yeah. Um, and that I have changed their life in some way. Um, you know, you get these little challenge coins. Yes. Um, those mean more to me than any of the awards on my wall, mm-hmm. you know, because it's coming from students. That's true. Yeah, I can see that. Did you have any? I just on? appreciate you you coming yes. and, and speaking with us and starting off this series. So it's a historic moment here. <laughs> <laughs> you have made your mark. Unintended. Well, I'm mm-hmm. always happy to have the opportunity to bloviate at length. Uh, I usually just do it without an invitation. <laughs> Thank you. We're using this as an excuse to have good conversations with our interesting colleagues. So right. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the chance to talk. So thank you. 